this may, this may seem completely out of left field for you, but you wrote a book about pray, for, for, for female audiences praying for your future husband. Yes. Now, you understand how, how that, that could just conjure up, seriously, that's, <laughs> that's really what you want to write about? Is there an equivalent thing for men? You know, all of that. Um, but I'm just fascinated by how, by where the idea for that book came from. I think it was Brazil. Mm -hmm. So um, why don't you tell us about that, and then let's just see where it goes. Sure. All right? Um, I think maybe I'll be, well, I'll try standing, but I kind of use my hands a lot, so if I end up taking the mic off, it'll be okay. So um, maybe eight or nine years ago, I was invited to speak in Brazil. My husband went with me, and after I taught at a conference, the publisher there, because the Christy Miller books had been translated into Portuguese, and so all these girls in Brazil were reading the Christy Miller books. And the publisher set up a series of schools and churches for us to go to and speak at for nine days in four different cities. And when we went to the very first one, the translator told me, OK, this is not on your schedule, but this is a school for teenage girls. And the organizers at the school would not take no for an answer. They demanded that you come here because they have taken the Christy Miller books and turned them into curriculum. So the students hit this school, all girls, have to read the books, memorize the Bible verses that are in the books, and answer the questions and write essays. So we'll just be here for 20 minutes, but just answer a few questions. So my husband and I walked in to the cafeteria, and we're walking down the center aisle, and all the girls noticed we were there, and they started screaming. Have you ever heard Brazilian girls scream? They were just crazy, and I thought maybe the roof was falling in, and I grabbed the translator and said, what's wrong? And he said, did no one tell you? In Brazil, you are a rock star. <laughs> and so my husband and I, I think they thought we were like Christy and Todd all grown up and coming to visit their school or something. So I went to the front and they're taking pictures and they're still screaming and they wouldn't quiet down. So I asked the translator, have them ask questions because maybe they'll listen to each other. So he opened it up, does anyone have a question? And one girl popped up and she said in Portuguese, I don't speak Portuguese, I don't know what she said, but I waited and he turned to me and he said, oh, this was a very bad idea. Here's her question. She wants to know, all the girls in Brazil are reading your books. They are coming to know Christ. They are making good decisions. They are holding out for a hero, but none of the boys of Brazil are reading your books. This is a problem. <laughs> so should they marry these boys or just not marry because it feels unbalanced to them. So in that moment, I know it was just the Holy Spirit just giving me the answer because I said, okay, girls of Brazil, this is your work. Now that you have come to Christ, you need to pray for the boys of Brazil. Pray for this generation that God's Spirit would do a new work and that he would get a hold of these young men and draw their hearts to his and that they would come to know him and live lives of integrity and they'd be transformed. And that's your work. Get on your knees. Fight like a girl. Get these, this, this new generation of men to, to be drawn to him supernaturally. And the whole auditorium was completely quiet. And then a few more questions and then I signed some books and then it was time to go and when we were leaving, there were about 12 girls at the door lined up, their arms linked, and they wouldn't let us through. And they said, through the translator, tell her that we are the girls of Brazil. And we asked the principal, and we can use this room every Friday after school, and we are going to pray. We started a praying for your future husband group, and we are going to pray for the boys of Brazil. They won't even know what hit them. <laughs> so, and I actually have heard from one of those girls who now lives in Canada, and she told me just about two months ago in an email how they continue to pray regularly for three years. But when I left there, I was thinking, it's one thing to just, you know, give this charge. Girls, you have to pray, but 
How do you teach them to pray? You don't pray, oh God, please give him blonde hair and <laughs> give him a good sense of humor or, you know, make him understand all of my emotions. Like, what is it that really matters spiritually for the eternal things that need to happen in our lives? And so I was talking to a friend of mine, Trisha Goyer, at a writer's retreat, and just in a really unexpected moment. She was taking a nap, and I was reading a book, and we were out sitting by the pool during the break, and she popped up from a dead sleep and said, we should write a book together. And I said, okay, what? She goes, I have no idea. I just think we should write a book together. Okay, so I wrote it down in my journal. Trisha thinks we should write a book together. All right. <laughs> and just prayed about that. So it had been about three years since I had been in Brazil, and Trisha and I were together again, this time in Montana, and we were both speaking at a, a retreat. So it was at a hotel. She went to park the car. I went into the lobby and was waiting for her, and this little 18-month-old boy came running over and just grabbed on my legs, and I picked him up and looking for his mom, and he just patted my face. He was the sweetest little boy. And um, pretty soon, this young mom came running over. Oh, I'm so embarrassed. He ran off. He never does that. I don't know what happened. And just then, Trisha walked in and saw this young mom. The young mother looked at Trisha and said, it's you. It's you. You came to my school over two years ago. And Trisha didn't remember the young mom. She speaks at a lot of schools because Trisha was a teen mom. She was pregnant at 15, had an abortion, pregnant again at 17 with a different boyfriend, decided I can't have an abortion again, kept that baby, and um, he's now grown and married, but she tells her story in schools. And this young mom said, you came to my school and you told us about how you didn't have the abortion the second time and that you, after you had that baby, you start praying for your future husband and that God gave you a Christian man and that you guys have been married all these 20 some years. And she said, I spoke with you afterward, but what you don't know is that I had an appointment at the um, clinic for Friday because I was pregnant and I was going to end the pregnancy. But when I heard you talk, I thought, I, I can't take this baby's life. And that's my baby. And I'm holding him, this little Toby who had run across the room and just come to me. And he's patting my face. And then he went to Trisha and he's hugging her. We I mean, just had this really tender moment. And then she's, this young mom said, and I, I did what you did. And I prayed that God would give me a fresh start and a, a husband who loved God. And oh, there's my husband now. And this really great guy came walking over and got involved in the whole story. And Trisha and I left that extraordinary meeting, believing that there is something we don't even understand of the power of praying, and that what we had done in Brazil and in classrooms to just toss out there, you should pray, you should pray that God gives you a, a, a future and a hope if his desire is for you to marry, that the person you marry loves God and follows him. So Trisha and I went to work because we realized that's the book we need to write. So we wrote Praying for Your Future Husband and um, both tell our stories in the book and then there's study questions. And I went through the book when it first came out. We, um, we live in Maui and we had this group of young college girls that I had been discipling. And so when the book first came out, I said, okay girls, I want to get together and meet with you and go through the book. And one of the young women that was in the group, um, her name's Alyssa, and she was really interested in getting together even beyond just the group and really praying, praying, praying for the right man. And she prayed her little heart out. I met with her every week. She ended up leaving Maui and she moved to Seattle and um, she married Jeff Bethke, that maybe you've seen some of Jefferson Bethke's videos. He's got just quite a, he wrote um, Jesus Greater Than Religion and several other books. And 
Alyssa and I deliberately prayed for that man for a number of years before she married him. Now they moved to Maui and they live down the street from us, so it's pretty great. But that's the long story to how to pray for your future husband. Yeah, so I, I mean, book ideas can come from so many places. I will say this to the people who are sitting on floors, we have chairs now. If you don't want to sit on the floor, if you're comfortable there, feel free. But we also, we also, have, we also have places for you now where you can be like the big people. <laughs> you don't have to be at the kids' table any longer. All right, so that's all I got as far as a question for Robin. What do you want to know? Yes. So I know you went on to write uh, Spoken for with Alyssa. Yes. Can you tell us about how that came about, how you guys decided to write that together? Yes, Alyssa and I wrote Spoken for, and that was really unexpected as well. Alyssa helped me... Um, for about a year and a half, coming every Friday morning and helping send out postcards or answer mail and things like that. And on, whenever I start a book, I have a binder. And I put the title of the book on the spine. And then I just start collecting and put whatever I need, whatever I find along the way into the binder. Sometimes I cut out pictures or print out little snippets or articles. So she was helping clean and look for things, and Alyssa saw this binder that said spoken for. She said, what's that? I said, oh, this is a book I started about eight years ago, and it's your identity in Christ, who you are, and believing that you're not up for grabs. You're spoken for. You're the bride of Christ. Like, you need to take note of who you are in Christ and live that way. And Alyssa said, oh, I wish you'd written that book because I need it for the high school girls that I'm doing this study with, and that would be ideal. So, well, maybe one day I'll finish it. And I, I thought about it for a couple years, but it just wasn't there. What I had written really sounded like Mama Robin. All right, you girls. <laughs> just believe who you are in Christ. And it needed just that other voice to balance out and more youthful. And so after Alyssa was married, I called her. No, I texted her one day and said, hey, I, are you going to be home tomorrow? I want to call you and talk about an idea I have. Because I thought Alyssa would be a perfect, balanced young voice for that book. And so the next morning when I called her, Alyssa, the first thing she said was, are you calling to ask me if I want to write a book with you? And we'd never, ever talked about that. And I said, how did you know that? She goes, I don't know. I just woke up and that's what I thought. And I was going, oh, Jesus told you. I wanted to tell you. <laughs> yes, that's why I'm calling you. And she goes, okay, is it spoken for? And I go, yeah, that's what I was thinking. And she said, I haven't forgotten about that in all these years. And so we went to work back and forth. So I'll write this little bit and you write this. And it was it really gave the book just the right balance. I'm really happy with how it turned out. And I've gone through... That, I've used that book for several group studies with high school girls, and it's been really strong, really effective, just getting all those verses that are in the book and really believing what God says about you. Thanks for asking that. Yes? Uh, was it discouraging at all trying to get published for the first time? Like, possibly, was it discouraging? trying to get published the first time. Absolutely. I remember a distinct moment where I was about ready to give up because I'd been turned down by so many publishers and there weren't that many left. And I just didn't have the confidence that I knew what I was doing because I knew I didn't know what I was doing. And I, where we lived at the time, we didn't have a dishwasher. And I always would put verses in the windowsill because I was at the sink a lot washing dishes. And I read this verse in Jeremiah 20, verse 9, that says, But if I say I will not mention him or speak anymore in his name, his word is in my heart like a fire, a fire shut up in my bones. I am weary of holding it in. Indeed, I cannot. And I wrote it on a 3 by 5 card, and I put it there. And it just made me weep because it was like, this book for these girls and this passion I have won't go away. And it just burns my belly like a fire. And even if I just finish the book and print it and make copies and give it to the girls in youth group, then maybe that's all I'm supposed to do. But it also made me believe, because another verse that was so strong during that season was in um, 
Psalm, I think it's 112, verse 18, and it's, let this be written for a future generation, that a people not yet created may praise the Lord. And I just got really bold in my spirit and started praying, God, can I finish this book? Will you open the doors for it to be published? And will it endure for a future generation so that young women who haven't even been born yet will be able to read this book? Because I, we just, at that time, our daughter was just born, and I could see her as that next generation. And um, God has answered that prayer in an extraordinary way. But the discouragement that would come in waves would mean that I had to decide that this was something I was going to do. Spiritually, I was anchored in why I was doing it. It wasn't a whim. But then just that tough determination to keep going and keep going. It's a marathon, just keep going. It's so painful, it's so embarrassing, it's so humiliating, but just to not give up and not give up. And when the first Christy Miller book was published, it was actually published by Focus on the Family that had just started a publishing house. And it was the third book of all the books they'd published. So when I was writing it, they weren't even a, they didn't even exist. So that continuing, continuing, continuing. There are many things that I have written over the years that are just in a file and they don't ever need to be <laughs> published, but they were really good exercise for me. So it was trying to discern from getting good feedback and critique what was really of the, the greatest value to really pursue instead of, well, this isn't working out, I'll pick up this other thing. It was more important to just find where the vein of gold was and just chip away at that vein of gold. But the discouragement is normal for anybody in the arts. Can I have an amen? <laughs> yeah, it's just how it goes. It builds you into a stronger person inside, but the way that it builds you is through deep humility. It really does. You just humble out over and over again, and you get stronger and stronger. It's kind of interesting. Yes? Uh, before you decided to pursue writing, how were you able to discern that that was God's will for you, or that that was just a passion? Um, that's a very good question, but I'm not sure I have a real cut and dried answer because I, when I was sharing about it in chapel this morning, it was more the, the need pushed me forward. And I know Oswald Chambers says, the need is not the call, the need is the opportunity. And so for me, it wasn't the call or the, like, I have to be a writer, I have to, if anything, it was these girls need other stories, and that really drove me. So the need was the opportunity, and I just kind of went down that path instead of the need being the call. Once I was established as a writer and had opportunities and invitations from other publishers, oh, would you write this for us? Would you consider co-authoring this? And there were different opportunities that had never been there before. Then it was more from a passion of, well, I could write this or I could write that, but where does that fire in my belly really burn for what I, I, can, I can hear the characters already speaking in my imagination and I can see the story unfolding and that's, that's enlivening when I go and sit down to write that. But this other project I was invited to consider it's just all uphill, and I can't really find my place in that. So I've, um, I've started a lot of things that will probably never be finished. And the, I know that the process of even just sifting out all the ideas sharpened my mind. So it was, everything's redeemable. I mean, everything's redeemable. It's all going to be used as a writer in the creativity but I have a lot of other writer friends that started from passion. From the time they were five years old, they knew they wanted to be a writer and nothing was going to stop them. And they 
it's just a different story than what mine is. Yes? Um, when you encounter rejection in different aspects of your life, um, how did you determine that it was either like God's protection and you came down a different path or like him telling you to persevere and stronger to the universe? So how did I sort out the rejection if it was, are you saying mostly the understanding of if it was God leading me down a different path yeah, as opposed to just, like yeah, <laughs> good questions, you guys, yeah. Um, this is why I think James told us to pray for wisdom. If any of you lacks wisdom, ask of God, he'll give generously, and he really does. So that's the first thing is for, for God to give give that wisdom. And over the years where I found the most clarity with any situation like that was to do sort of a bullseye. So I have this inner circle and then this next layer out here and then this layer out here. And I highly value the opinions of the people in this inner circle. But it's a small circle and there's only maybe five people, maybe six that have earned the right to be in that circle. So if I go to them and say, I'm thinking of this, and what do you think? And they know me. They love me. They, they can see things I can't see. So they give that feedback or advice, but they've earned that place. But then there's this outer circle. Maybe this would include a publisher. Hey, we think you'd be great at writing this. Or, you know, you should work on something like this. Or this is readers. Why don't you write a book about blah, blah, blah? And so I, you know, I listen respectfully, but they don't carry as much weight. It's like, you don't know me. You don't know how hard my life is. You don't know how difficult it is to do this work. And so thank you for the suggestion. I respectfully receive it, but I can't listen to everyone in that next circle. Like, oh, oh, they think I should, I should have a passion for that. I should oh, maybe they're saying I shouldn't write this. It's like going back to that, that focus, God, give me wisdom, and then asking counsel from those that I really value their opinion. And their opinion in years past has proven true. I have had to take people that I had in that inner circle and just put them out here in the next circle because, oh, maybe for a season, they really were in sync. And, you know, you float away, but... Nothing, no bad reason, but just like, I, I honor you, but your opinion won't change what I'm doing because I, I'm more focused here. But then this is where it's really crazy making. And the older you get, I think it's a little easier to discern. But especially when you're young, this outer circle here, there's such a popcorn of opinions. You should do this. Why didn't you do this? I think you're really good at this. You did it. And you, you can latch on to someone when really the amount of value and weight you should put to their opinion is a feather. Like you, you haven't earned that place in the inner circle to really speak into my life. So the crazy making happens when you, oh, somebody said I should do this. Oh, somebody. And instead of just pulling in and really being focused. So then I think that's how you can discern that, is this the Lord leading me? Or is this the purpose of this for this rejection or turning another down another path? I, I can see more clearly how to take that next step. And all these other voices get softer and softer. And you just become gracious and thank you. Thank you, thank you. I'm not gonna do that. Don't care about that. You're nuts. <laughs> bye bye. But it's it's when you try to put weight, put an anchor on any of those other voices. Is God speaking to me through them? It's how does you your writing process differ from that of when you're writing a nonfiction book like spoken for versus one of the fiction books? Nonfiction was a lot more difficult for me. It felt like assignments of the three or four or five. I think I've written five nonfiction books all in all. They're not all in print anymore, but um, it was more like, a, a, like a, an assignment because I needed a table of contents and a summary, and then each chapter had to have a theme and a purpose so that you could select the title for that chapter and then know what was going to happen in that chapter. It's kind of designing 
like being an architect of the book. Whereas with a novel and the storytelling, it's a lot more free flowing. So whenever I start a novel, I use, like I was saying, those binders. And um, I always start with a prayer. I write out a prayer and dedicate the project to the Lord. And he can use it. He can not use it. It can be published or not published. But it's, it's, I dedicate the work to him and ask him to bless the work of my hands. So that's the first page in every binder. And then when you turn the page, it's like, it's like um, paper dolls in some of the books. It's like when I first started writing Christy and Todd in Summer Promise, I was looking at a surfer magazine, and I found a picture of a surfer with these really vibrant blue eyes. And so I just cut out just like from his nose up and his hair and <clears throat> put a glue stick on the page, stuck it there, and thought, okay, I'll put that in the book somehow because that really struck me. And then on and pictures of what Christie's outfits look like and just pasted things and I think of ideas and write it down. But then when I got to the point when I was writing about Todd, I looked at the picture and I wrote, okay, now how would I describe this character? Oh, he has screaming silver blue eyes. And, and there was the sort of description for Todd that stuck through the whole series. So the binders become like these visual touch points and I think about the story and I take little notes and when I'm ready to start writing, I never know how it's gonna end, but I always start <clears throat> the first probably five pages I write by hand because there's something else that engages physically and emotionally for me when I write by hand. And I always pick <clears throat> a fresh page and a fresh day and it's just chapter one and just start writing and writing and writing. And then once I feel like I'm in the story and I can see the characters and hear the rhythm, then I go to the computer. And when I transplant this handwritten part, it changes a lot. I start the editing process then. And then I just keep going on the laptop and just kind of see how the story unfolds. Yes? So I know you're writing kind of What was your relationship with writing before? I did like to write, and actually in second or third, my sister's here, I don't know, remember Julie, I won that Miss Mary Award? I wrote an essay and I won an award in like second grade <laughs> because I just, I liked words and I liked stories. And so I had, I have a diary that's pretty funny, but I kept from like sixth grade on and there are all kinds of poetic things in there. And I liked the sound of words, but I think I, I continually felt that I wasn't good enough or talented or I didn't have what it, an author? I'm not an author. Like I really didn't ever hear that or see that. And I did have a teacher in high school who wrote on my paper on an essay or something, you should be a writer. This is, you know, A plus, you should be a writer. It's like, why? That's weird. That, what does she see? So I didn't, it was latent in me, but I didn't see it or have others who were in that inner circle, yeah, that were speaking that truth into me. This is something to develop. This is something not everybody has. And I honestly felt like, doesn't everybody think this way? Can't everybody just throw a sentence together and make it sound kind of pretty? And No, kind of blind. We all often are blind to our own strengths or, you know, if someone asks, what's your spiritual gift? And, you know, it's... I don't know. There's things I like to do, but it comes easy for me. You don't see that necessarily as a unique gift. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? You're doing good with the questions. Yes. Um, what did your inspiration for talk about his character and his Todd's character and his personality are a lot like my husband, Ross. Very, very much like Ross. Originally, I was going to name that character Ron, because when I was in junior high, I had a crush at summer camp on Ron. And he gave me a little gold bracelet that was an ID bracelet, like Todd gives Christy in the book. And, and um, yeah, it was like my first crush was Ron. But the girls in the Sunday school class were like, Ron, no, we want Todd. I don't know why. <laughs> I think at the time I had been like thinking, Todd, that's like Saturday Night Live name or something. I don't know. It was kind of funny, like 
the loser name, but they loved it. That was their surfer name for them. So, and Aunt Marty was going to be Aunt Bonnie. Oh no, we don't like Bonnie. We want Marty. Okay. <laughs> yeah, but his his Todd's deep love for God is just very much like my husband, and kind of a quiet, and you never know. And where is is he going to show up or not? And the unexpected. Yeah, that's my husband. There was a hand over here. Yes. Uh, when you first turned in your book, Wildflowers, to get published, and your editor told you that you could write for many for plates, how did you take that? Or what did you do to get many for plates? First, I'm so, so honored that you read my blog. How else would you have known that? <laughs> or you're reading it on your phone right now, a little extra credit. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, so what he's referring to, and I just wrote about it on my blog last week that um, I had written a whole series, Glenbrook, and I wrote seven books, and the eighth one was uh, originally called Meadows, and I wrote the entire book. I turned it in on deadline. I had a brand new editor. I knew my editor. I loved my editor. She was Francine Rivers' editor. I wanted her to be my editor. I really liked her. And so I waited for the phone call. And when she called me back, she said, I know you can do better than this. I want you to start all over. And I felt like on Wizard of Oz when Toto pulls the curtain back. And I felt like, pay no attention to the woman behind the screen. She doesn't know what. It's like the jig is up. They know that I'm a fake. I don't know what I'm doing. And so <laughs> it's like I took this one editor to you know, finally call me out on it. But she just talked me through where she saw. She was in the inner circle, yeah? So she, she had earned the right to be there. And she said, these are the kinds of stories I, th I think you have in you, but I want to draw them out. Try writing about an older character, a woman who's in midlife, instead of these 20-year-old characters, and, and write about issues with the difficulties in marriage. And so I went, well, at first I, and I said it in the blog too, I had a very good pity party that included great dark chocolate and a cup of tea and I just felt like this is where I get to learn. I didn't have the training in classes maybe or the education but this is how I'm learning to be a writer with the privilege of having these kind of mentors that care enough about me to push me further. And um, because you know Meadows could have been published and that could have been the end of like, okay, no, no more interest in any books. But that book, Wildflowers, sparked a lot of interest from um, one group of women that read it was the Women of Faith organization and said, would you now write a Women of Faith novel for us? And so I wrote a mother-daughter story, Gardenias for Breakfast. But what came out of that was writing the first Sister Chick book as well. And then this whole Sister Chick series took off and the first book just sold crazy and was in Target and hundreds of thousands of copies going out of the series and so that's why the publisher had all this money and they said well we'd like to send you to these places that you're writing about and my, I said that in chapel this morning my husband was in the meeting and he said well you have to pay for her to go there then and they said okay so I, I mean if any of you love to travel and you you wait for decades for the chance to go anywhere and then it's because you write stories that someone's going to pay you to travel around the world and yeah it's, it's, that's god that's so cool but how i felt about the rejection was that i needed to view it as my discipline to become a better writer instead of just going yeah yeah i could write a book in my sleep and you know i don't need anybody to tell me what to do because i've done this so many times and i'm on the bestseller list and i won an award for the last book it was more, again that process of continually humbling yourself before the lord cuz when he lifts you up it's good it's really good yes um, i think going off the last question um, how do you think your writing has evolved my writing has evolved quite a bit in the last 20 years. Um, actually, Professor Dean and I were speaking about that a little bit. I'm, I'm 
when I go from here, um, I have some meetings in LA with some film producers, and I have some projects that are in the works and under contract on some of my books, but I have been working with a producer for quite some time for the Christy Miller project, pro probably for a TV series. And we've hit all kinds of roadblocks and opposition, and it's very interesting. But what I had to do to prepare for this next meeting was to go back to the very first book and put together a treatment for a screenplay that was different from the other. We have two screenplays already, and neither of them are hitting the sweet spots. So to restructure it, and I'm a humbling experience all over to learn how to write screenplays. It's completely different. And so to, I went back and read Summer Promise, and parts of it I went, oh, he would never say it that way, or oh, that's so elemental, or oh. But I still felt this. God did something with this book. I cannot explain why this book is still in print and why it sold millions of copies and why it's been translated in so many languages and around the world. That's just God's touch on that. And so taking that prayer again to writing screenplays, going, unless the Lord builds a house, unless the Lord writes the screenplay, I mean, it's a lot of labor in vain. It has to be his spirit just infusing and using that talent that's already there or the the knowledge of how to do this but to I don't know just to, to do something more because it's it's really something when this is just a sidetrack thing but my husband and I last month met with a lawyer because we had to prepare our living trust our will and you know, nobody wants to even think about that. And we had put it off and put it off. And we better put this in place because after, you know, if I got hit by a bus today, <laughs> um, I, there would still be the, the intellectual property would continue. What if someone 10 years ago, 10 years from now, wants to make a movie out of a book I wrote? There's still revenue that would come in. And so to ensure that that would be divided between our two children and everything would be in the corporation and be in place. And that, that meeting really just stunned me to realize what God has done because it's, it's something as a writer to know that those words can go on and on and on and on. And they're, th most people, when they die, they stop working, but I'm going to keep working after I'm gone, apparently. <laughs> and so it has to, the money has to go to somebody, so my kids get it. <laughs> yes. How long does it generally take you to write a book? Is it faster for fiction or not fiction? A great question. How long does it take to write a book? It has ver varied with different books. And if it's a really, really good one, um, you know, I'm really ready to write it and it's all in my imagination. It could be about three months. But some of them, it's uh, a year and a half. Victim of Grace took me six years. And um, yeah, you can read that on my blog too. And that was, <laughs> I just wrote, that's another blog I wrote about last week. Because after I signed the contract to do Victim of Grace, I started writing that book. And what the publisher wanted was for me to tell my story, how I became a writer, and sort of the journey. And it just, it wouldn't, it was so, blah. to me it was, it was flat to write about my own experience. I'd rather write about a fictional character becoming a writer or you know, do a teaching book on how to, be, how to get published or something. But to, that turning, turning the focus to my bumbling self and tell my story was just really draining. And so I kept putting it off and putting it off. And when I finally saw what the book was to be, it was that each chapter I took a different woman from the Bible and how I related to her. And I love the stories of the women in the Bible and how God tells their whole story. I mean, not we don't know all the details, but these, these poignant times in their life that are encapsulated in those stories and the mistakes they made and everything else. And so I felt like that's how I can tell the story. So for that book, it was, it, it literally was six years, and I wanted to 
give up the contract and have my agent cancel it. And she's in that inner circle. And she said, I know you can do it. It'll be very important for you to do that. And I love that book now because it just shows how amazing God is. And it's, it's, a, it's a really tender, tender story. What made you, because you wrote the Christian Highlander series quite a few years ago, what made you pick up those two characters and start writing about them so many years later? Oh, what made me pick up and start writing about Christy and Todd again? They would not leave my imagination, and I wondered about them all the time. How are they doing? They've been married now for a while. Are they getting along? Are they going to have a baby? <laughs> What's happening? What kind of jobs would they have? And it was... It was sort of stirring in me to, to write about them for a while. And I went to one of the publishers that I'd worked with and said, I think I'd like to write about these characters again. And they said, no, we don't want it. We couldn't you know, reject it. <laughs> we, we don't want to publish that. So I put it aside and thought, OK, there's because I'm telling them, I want to write this for a market, which is college, 20s, young married. And they're saying, well, they don't want to read books about early marriage or young marriage, that's not a market. They do, do some science fiction or do some, <laughs> you know, romance or something, but not, you're, you're kind of picking a genre that doesn't exist. But it was the same thing when I first started writing, and I just felt like there's just stories to be told, and I want to tell them. So I, um, and of course, readers for years, what happens next? They'd write to me all the time, and can, are you ever going to write more about Christy and Todd? So um, my husband and I were on a camping trip. We were leaving, again, a camping trip. Hmm, take note. Things happen when I go on camping trips. I never realized that. But we were um, headed to the backside of Maui, to Hana, to go camping. And I was telling him about this. And, uh, and he said, then you just write the books. You just write them. Don't worry anymore about being accepted by a publisher. You just write the book, and we'll figure out how to publish it. And that's what we did. And for the first time, I self-published and have really enjoyed the freedom of that, working with editors that I have worked with at publishing houses who are now out of jobs and are working freelance and happy to have the work, and working with designers who are really happy to have the work. And I just have this whole network of people I've worked with. So it's like, we don't need no stinking publisher. No, we do need publishers. I'm still working with publishers, and I have a book I just finished with a publisher. It's been a great experience. I will continue to work with traditional publishing houses, but they don't always accept everything I want to write or, you know, they're, they're not interested in it. So the opportunities that are there now for writers to publish on their own and be a hybrid writer, do both, is just great. This is a great time to be a writer. It really is. Yes. Between self-publishing or through a traditional publisher, it completely depends on the project and what kind of support the traditional publisher would have for the, the project and if it's part of another series. What I liked about self-publishing, and I'm in a unique position because I have so many friends that do all the necessary parts. It's, just, it's imperative that you have a very good editor and a proofreader and that you have a designer and to work all together so all the, you know, it's a lot of work. Um, but what I liked about that was that at the onset of writing Christy and Todd, The Married Years, is that I could write whatever I wanted to write. And when I wrote, um, I won't say which one it was. There's, there were some books that I wrote that were entirely directed by the publishing house. So they said, here's your contract, and this is what we want you to write. This is what has to happen in each book. This is, and, and I was happy to do that because I was learning how to write, and it was, you know, it was, we needed the money. My husband's a youth pastor. What can I say? And so I wrote these books, but it was all like I was being driven. And I, I knew I could never do that again because once I'd write it and turn it in, then the publishing house would say, well, we want it this way or that way or change this. So it really stifled that creativity. So I loved self-publishing and just going, I can write whatever I want. And it can be edited to clean it up. But it's, it's um, so I, but the other part of that with the editors, I have a content editor. 
and then a line editor, and then a proof editor, because all that is necessary. And many people who self-publish just go, oh, I ran a spell check. It's good. I'll put it up on Amazon. And you're doing yourself a disservice, because you don't look like a professional then. Yes? I wonder if you could tell us about the daily discipline of sitting down and writing, even if you have your binder, doesn't have your visuals, or yeah. the inspiration's not coming. What's your process in that kind of work? Yeah, the daily discipline of writing. When I first started, I had two little kids at home. My husband was a youth pastor, and I also had a, some random part time jobs doing various things. And um, there was no time to write. And so I knew in order to get those chapters to those girls in the Sunday school class that next week, I had to find the time to write. And I was always too tired at night. So I was reading in C.S. Lewis's Letters to an American Lady how he loved this something like this, the still dewy cobwebbed hours of the morning. He said, I rise before dawn, make a proper pot of tea, and answer all my correspondence before breakfast. And I thought, well, if it worked for Jack, I'm getting me a teapot. So <laughs> I went and literally bought my first teapot. I think my sister bought it for me, that little brown one. Yes, Julie, thank you. And I, I got a teapot, and I set the alarm for 3 o'clock, three days a week. And I would get up at 3. I'm a, I can do that. I mean, like, my brain is awake then. And, but by 8 o'clock that night, it's all over. <laughs> and so I would make a proper pot of tea and then just sit down and start writing. And no one ever called. The kids never bothered me. There was never any interruptions. And I got so much done. So I still, I did that for so many years, probably 15 years, just the discipline. And I've been friends with Jerry Jenkins for a long time. And he taught me that early on. Like, you just go to work. There's dishes in the sink. You're, if you were at an office, you wouldn't be doing dishes. You, you get up out of your house, and you go to wherever your home office is, and you are at work. And you have to stay there until you get out whatever needs to come out. And sometimes it's just hours, and it's just a few paragraphs. But you've done the work. And other times, it's just free-flowing and free-flowing. And oh, I got to pick up the kids from school. And ah, I don't want to stop. I'm going to. But it's that showing up and doing the work. And rarely do you feel like it. Rarely. Rarely. Even at 3 o'clock in the morning with a nice cup of tea, it's still like, I want to go back to bed. <laughs> or, oh, and um, another writer friend, Angie Hunt, does a little trick where she always, when she stops writing, at the end of a chapter, she always makes herself write the first few paragraphs of the next chapter so that you don't come back to work and go, oh, where was I? I don't remember. Or, but just to, or even in the next scene. So it's just sort of, you make, your stop, you make yourself stop mid-scene so that everything's in action and you have to, you know. And I've done that and sometimes I think about it and I go to bed and I dream about these characters being kind of like frozen <laughs> and can't wait to get up in the morning and go back at it. But I still, I still get up early. Uh, my rhythm is a lot different now because I have more leisure, not leisure time, but I can arrange my schedule more easily to what suits me. But I, I still do the best in the morning. Yeah. Is that for one I'm so glad you guys came. Yeah, but this is this is very cool. In the middle of an afternoon, I on know. a foggy day when all of you usually take your nap. <laughs> yeah. For the ones who are in my classes, take your nap during my classes. <laughs> um, Robin, thank you. Thank, thank you. you for